Welcome, Pewter Report readers, listeners, and viewers to another edition of the Pewter Report podcast, energized by Celsius. I am John Ledyard from pewterreport.com. Along with me today, you know him very well, ladies and gentlemen, and you got to know him even better this past week, the one, the only, Matthew Montero! What an intro. Thank you. Nailed been, it. And I've been off back, for a week. John. Thank yeah, you, we, Matt. we've missed you. It's good to see your face again. It's good to be back here, Matt. It really is. It's good to be back taking in Bucks practices. It's good to be back learning a little something from you and your podcast introductions while I was gone. You added in the viewers. I was okay, like, Okay. So when you said that, I was like, wait a second. That's right. Did I start that or had people previously been no, saying that? But I'm, that I'm is glad. you. Yeah. That's you the are Matt Matera stamp not, right there. Right. You're a trendsetter, <laughs> Matt. That's what you are. Trendsetter. You get a get an opportunity and all you do is change the game. That's what we like about you. It's pretty yeah, good I to mean, be back, man. Yeah, dude. It's awesome. Uh, we, we definitely missed you. I'm glad you were able to go to training camp today. And you know what? You got the full carte blanche because you got to see them practice outside. You saw what happens when there's a weather delay, not delay, but mm -hmm. when weather comes into play and everyone yep. has to move inside, you saw them practice inside. So you saw yep. everything that you got to see here in essentially what is your first Bucks training camp. I mean, you came to true. Tampa like halfway through the season, just like Ross Cockrell did. That's right. It's been <laughs> uh, a whirlwind of kind of, I mean, I was covering the team, but from Pennsylvania yes. and then there were all the COVID protocols. And then this year I missed, I was up in Pennsylvania for about three weeks uh, because we had a bunch of family things had to go down. Then one of my best friends got married, which I was very excited about two of my best friends, I should say, because I'm not just friends with the guy, although I was one of his groomsmen, but I was also, really good friends with the woman that he married and and was a part of kind of helping those two find each other at one point so it was awesome marriage is a one it really is and so it was fun to be up there it was fun to be a part of it and while i was there i got to meet a an unbelievable pewter report fan and listener and a great guy and his wonderful wife matt zeewe has been listening to this podcast for a long time. And when he heard that I was going to be in this wedding and he's friends with my friends who were getting married, he was ecstatic about it. Got to meet him, got to hear his his thoughts on the podcast. Likes you too a lot, by the way. Got to well, meet I him. Mean, got great, to hear great first name. I already like the guy. <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> exactly right. So yeah, Matt Zeewee and his wife, Katie. Uh, man, that was awesome uh, to be able to talk with them and to be able to get their thoughts on the podcast. He's been a Bucks fan living in Pennsylvania for like wow. his whole life. Yes, uh, unbelievable commitment. Not many Bucks fans up in that area. And through the through the lean years and everything, he's been a Bucks. There he is. He's listening on the pod. Matt a. I love it, Matt. What's yes, up? Yes, and his wife Katie has become a Bucks fan as well. And she's a cheering for them as well up there listening to the Peter Report podcast. And then when we when we actually got to introduce and sit and talk for a while, she was like, I actually recognize this is going to be weird, but I recognize your voice because he's always listening to the podcast. <laughs> well, four times a week, you there. know, it's pretty much, That's right. uh, you know, a, a, a common day thing now. Yeah, it was. It was great to be able to meet them. Great to be able to spend some time with them. I love hearing from Bucks fans who've been with the team through thick and thin. And when they're hailing from Pennsylvania, from like the Erie PA area, yeah. that's just even better to me because the, the faithfulness of enduring those losing seasons Definitely, definitely deserves to be acknowledged. So great stuff. Thank you, Matt and Katie. You made the stay up in Pennsylvania really great uh, and hope you're both doing really, really well and recovering from that wedding as well as I was because the wedding was great, but I had to leave that wedding, Matt. I had to leave that wedding at like, this is this is my commitment, Bucks fans. I was inspired by Matt and Katie's story and this was my commitment. Left the wedding with the family, four and one-year-old in tow. And we drove back to Tampa Bay through the night, Friday night. All That's the way insane. through the day, Saturday. Wait, Sunday. This was Saturday yeah. night into Sunday. Drove through. All the days are running together. And so we had we drove like literally just right through the night and got back to Tampa at like four in the afternoon yesterday. Ate dinner, put the kids down, went to bed. Fell asleep at 738, Matt. You know me. <laughs> I averaged like five hours of sleep a night. Slept for nine hours. It was incredible. Wow. I feel I feel 100%. I feel great. I'm ready to crush this training camp practice. Let's get to the football takes, Matt. But first... We got to talk about our good friends over at Celsius. Look at this. I was drinking. I, you know how many Celsius it took me to get in that car ride back to Tampa Bay? Probably a three lot. minimum. <laughs> at one point, I was just drinking Celsius and not eating food, and I had to stop getting some <laughs> heat to catch that part of my body back up. But 
Yeah, there's the orange cells. The, the, is that the orange you got there? That was the the peach mango, actually. Oh, the peach mango. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's a good one, too. Somebody just sent me the raspberry one that they're drinking today. That was uh, somebody sent me that earlier this morning. That was a good one. Uh, I was mainly on peach vibe, tropical vibe, wild berry on the way back. My wife was drinking an orange. We didn't have any grape. We ran out of grape. That's that's normally her go to. And so she was drinking that one. She took a couple hours drinking or driving and drinking Celsius. Um, and so, yeah, it was great. We got it way right back, but we couldn't have done it without Celsius. So thank you, Celsius, for getting me back to Tampa Bay just in time for Bucks training camp. Uh, week two. I appreciate that. Uh, as always, you know, you know where to find Celsius. Click on those banner ads over at PeterReport.com. Uh, check out all the stuff that they do, all the different flavors that they have. No sugar, terrific stuff for you. Uh, we love it. And down, if you click the link below in YouTube, you can also get their fast energy bars that are unbelievable. The taste had one this morning coming out of Bucks practice, had one terrific stuff click on that link you can get the variety pack and get a couple different different flavors uh, of those they're, ter they're terrific uh flash gordon is thinking about trying celsius is a big day flash gordon you are always in this podcast you're always commenting early about things that have nothing to do with the bucks i do read your threads i do appreciate them they do make me laugh definitely try uh some try some celsius because i think it's uh it's gonna it's gonna change it's gonna blow your mind a little bit you know what's blowing my mind matt matera and I actually want to hear from you a lot about this past week and weekend and what you saw at Bucks training camp practices. But Antonio Brown, my my guy, I mean, this guy <laughs> just absolutely tearing up practice. Uh, looked exceptional. Looked like he hadn't lost a bit, a uh, step at all uh, the whole way. Uh, was incredible to kind of see that he's been able to keep himself in this position, still just absolutely balling out. Um, every corner that lined up against him, it uh, felt like uh, got – a little taste of what it's like to try and cover Antonio Brown in an NFL game. And it was not fun for them. Cameron Kinley, rough day. And AB was a big part of the reason why I actually feel bad for these bucks depth pieces at corner, because there's not a whole lot going their way when they line up against some of these top guys. I mean, it is, it is tough sledding. Imagine being like Cameron these guys and trying to make your way onto an NFL roster, you know, as this fifth cornerback spot hangs wide open, all you got to do is stop, Mike Evans or Chris Godwin or Antonio Brown or Scotty Miller just, you know, once or twice. And you've done it more than anybody else on the roster has done it. So uh, great opportunity for them for sure. Uh, but it's also been great, quite a challenge. Antonio Brown must have caught four or five balls in the first team period. Um, caught a toe tapper on the sideline, uh, then came back and caught what dig in the middle of the field, outran everybody in the end zone. Flipping out when he gets to the end zone, yelling, screaming, all the that's how he handles practice. He's not like a lot of guys when they practice, a lot of veterans. Antonio Brown talks a lot. He is extremely high energy. Um, he talks a lot of trash. I don't think he talks trash in games, actually, but he'll talk a little bit uh during games uh, or during practices. Um, he will talk a little bit of trash at times. So I don't know what happened to Matt. Maybe he just decided he didn't want to be on the pod with me after all, but hopefully we get him back in here because I want to hear his thoughts on the weekend and, and kind of what went down over the weekend when there was, wasn't a couple pods uh, to do. We got to fill you all in on that too. But yeah, Antonio Brown being as impressive as he's been, I wouldn't say that's a surprise necessarily, but I do think I heard enough whispers to know Bucks fans were, you know, kind of a little bit confused. I think last year when, oh, okay, Antonio Brown comes in, but where's the big plays and where's that part of, of what he brings to the table and it, really didn't happen for a couple of weeks. And then at that point, things really kind of took off pretty quickly. So still think very highly of his future and your future as well, Matt. Uh, we lost you there for a minute. Can you hear me okay now? Yes, I can. I, I apologize about that. Um, if you're in Tampa right now, it's obviously raining and thunder and lightning. There's just this loud thunder and then all the power went out in my apartment. So I was, uh, luckily it came back on in like two or three yeah, seconds after that, but I was scrambling to the, be like, all right, I can go from a hotspot for my phone, but like, oh, well, what if my phone dies like while the show's going on? Right. Um, but we're good now. So Hey, we were talking about Antonio Brown. I was saying how he tore up camp today, and he looked like – I mean, Mike Evans and Chris Godwin were great too. They both made plays. But, you know, A.B. just had that vintage A.B. I saw it so many times in Pittsburgh, just absolutely tearing it up. And I was just wondering if you saw some of the same things this past weekend when you were watching practice. Yeah, absolutely. He looks like a guy that is just determined and very happy to be out there. I mean, even when he was just doing individuals, when he first started uh, coming back into practice, and I think the Bucks have done a good job of easing these guys that had offseason surgery, with the exception of Brady, because, you know, Brady's on his own level. But um, guys like Antonio Brown and OJ Howard, we, we've seen them 
the Bucs really take it slowly with them. You know, they missed the first couple of practices and they come in and they just work individual drills and then they moved on to, to team practice. Uh, Brown has looked great so far. Um, he was getting so hyped up, yelling, let's up and go, even yeah. though it was like individual drills and he's that running was on air. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, it seems like a guy that he's pretty much a, a self-motivator watching him in person now. And when he's practiced with the team as well, I thought he's done a great job. Now, granted, a lot of the times when he's been in there, he's been going up against the third and fourth string corners. So, like, of course, he's going to dominate. I know he had a double move. I believe it was on Cameron Kinley or maybe Antonio Hamilton the other day. He scored on a double move. I mean, it was a yeah. great pump fake from Tom Brady. And, and Bruce Arians said after practice, he was like, yeah, Antonio Brown on a double move. That's stealing. Really like fair. that's just stealing. And then he. <laughs> the funny it on thing the is, he after. didn't really do that in Pittsburgh very often, Matt. Like really? that was it was not. I mean, I wouldn't say it never happened, but it wasn't like a go-to thing. The offense wasn't. It was vertical. I mean, maybe had plenty of vertical chances, but yeah. I don't think it was as heavy vertical. You know, Aaron's got to find other ways to get guys open vertically because of how vertical the offense already is. And so one of those ways is double moves. So there's more of them in this offense than there was in Pittsburgh. And so yeah, it's uh, been a nice real revelation for him. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you want to talk. Oh, no. I think we lost Matt's power again. <laughs> the storm is just wrecking Matt, apparently, but I am having no issues here on the storm side of things. I have not. I don't have any storm, so it, we'll see how long it can go before uh, it, it affects me as well, but uh, not it hasn't happened so far. It was funny today that it was two ex-Steelers that really stole the show. I thought that was I found myself laughing at that a little bit as Antonio Brown, you might expect that, but Ross Cockrell had the greatest day probably of his professional career. Uh, maybe even personal. I mean, this guy's wife just qualified for the Olympic finals this morning. And I believe it was the 400 meter hurdles. And he got to watch it with the whole Bucks fam, with the whole Bucks team. And uh, it was awesome, man. I mean, the celebration was great. Uh, it was exciting stuff. It was fun to see. Um, it was just, I don't know, it was, it was fun to see the celebration kind of take place in that room and see how connected with her and to what was going on with her journey kind of as an athlete. Uh, you know, having only known Ross for less than a full year even for a lot of those guys, um, it was really, really cool. So it was a cool moment for him. Then he went out to Bucks practice and absolutely tore it up. Three interceptions uh, on the day of practice. I mean, for a player in practice, that is very rare to get three interceptions and he was playing new position for a lot of practice. He's still playing safety, which he's been playing for the last about the last week. Really. Um, they've been trying him out there, but uh, I mean, he made some really good plays. These weren't like cupcake interceptions either. Really. I mean, the first interception was kind of on a, on a, on a couple of drag routes underneath in the red zone. He kind of flew by, picked off Gabbert. Uh, oh, sorry, Ryan Griffin and took it back to the end zone, ran all the way back down to the other end zone uh, for a touchdown. And the second interception was off Griffin as well. He kind of jumped a pass to the middle of the field. I think it was a dig route or post or something. He jumped a pass to the middle of the field, and he picked off uh, Ryan Griffin at that point um, for a second interception of the day. Then his third interception came actually as they it was the last play they saw before they were bringing the media out um, of the of practice. Uh, so it ended kind of ended practice. What? But he intercepted um, Blaine Gabbard on a deep throw. Uh, he made like a kind of a diving pick. Uh, he was on the ground when he when he caught it. And so, um, yeah, just, I mean, great ball skills all day. His best play wasn't even an interception, I think. It was a deep throw from Brady, I believe, to Tyler Johnson down the middle of the field. Johnson had beaten the corner, and Brady threw one up for him. And it was it was, uh, it was was Cockrell who kind of recovered from his safety position and got up, turned his head around, and knocked the ball away clean. Um, just an awesome day for him. I mean, again, like just not very often that you've seen – any DB in practice have that kind of a performance, let alone your number four DB, maybe your number four, so your number four corner, maybe your number four safety. Heck of a day for Ross Cockrell, Matt. I mean, yes, today was a, a heck of a day, but he's having a heck of a camp. And I don't know if you just spoke that, about that while my uh, power went out again for the second <laughs> time in, in my apartment. But everything, thankfully, turns on very quickly. It's just the Wi Fi, you know how it is when it goes right. out, you got to oh, wait yeah. for it to come back. Anyway, I mean, three interceptions today while he's transitioning from playing both corner and safety. Uh, he has at least five interceptions in camp because I know he had an interception on Kyle Trask the other time that everyone was indoors. And then he had one as well 
on the first or second day of tra- uh, uh, of training camp where it went off the receiver's hands and and he ended up being the benefactor of it. But he has at least five interceptions. I mean, as far as the defense goes, if he's not number one, Ross, Co- Ross Cockrell is at least in the top three of players that have had the best camp. I mean, he's all over the field. He's in the mix with plays. Sure, he'll get beat from time to time, but that's what's going to happen when you're going up against yeah. Mike and Chris and a- Antonio Brown. But I mean, for the most part, how could you not be thrilled about a guy that's playing two positions when they needed him to play safety when right. so much was going on with Whitehead out and Antoine Winfield missed a day and he was able to help out Mike Edwards, who's another guy who's having, I think, a really good camp. Right. Um, and obviously he's going to have an impact on special teams, too, at least we think. With, with Cockrell. I mean, this guy has just been a plus yeah. no matter where you look uh, or whatever your grading standard is. This guy has just been uh, truly great. And, you know, his sister's an Olympian and she had a great day too. So the Cockrell fam- family is just, I mean, yeah, they're on top of the are, world right now. People in the chat are saying sister. I, I hope I didn't say is like his mom was an Olympian or so. I don't know what I, I must've said something else, but people in the chat are saying sister, unless they're not talking to me, but maybe I must've said a different relative name I, I i knew it was a sister so i don't know what i said but i must have not said something else <laughs> hope i didn't say it was like his mom or something like that um but whatever the case yeah no he it was a great day for him obviously and he wasn't the only bucks db but i want to press pause there for a second matt just because are we i'm not ready to necessarily jump into this full-fledged but considering what you're saying about the first week of practice for ross cockrell and what i'm saying about what happened today although i know some of it was a safety I know he's not going to start at safety, but is it crazy to think that Ross Cockrell could play well enough to work his way into the, one of the top three corner spots? I mean, I'm not trying to hate on Jamal Dean, but he just hasn't, I don't know. Like I've read the recaps from you and and from then I've seen what the other Bucks media have said. And it feels kind of like he hasn't been great. Like he's been okay. And today was definitely not a, a great day. The frustrating part about Jamel Dean is that he could play great against anybody and TJ Simmons could beat him to the back corner of the end zone for what should have been a touchdown if Ryan Griffin doesn't throw a couple yards behind him. Like I, That's just every rep with Jamel Dean. It doesn't feel like you have any idea what you're getting with Jamel Dean. I, yeah, it's tough to have a wild card in that sense. I will say I, I thought Dean played well yesterday. He, he had a good pass breakup. I think overall in camp, there's been a lot of fun matchups, especially between him and Scotty Miller, and you're getting speed versus speed there, which I think is super fun. Right. From my assessment, and I would almost lump the quote-unquote big three of the, of the corners that the Bucks have with SMB and Carlton Davis and Jamel Dean, where I think all of them so far – have done a very solid job in training camp. They haven't gotten a ton of interceptions. SMB had an interception the other day, came off of a uh, a pass breakup from linebacker Joe Jones, and, and SMB was right there mm-hmm. to make the play. Overall, I would say Carlton, Sean Murphy Bunting, and Jamel Dean have done a good job of, you know, in, in pass coverage, they're covering pretty well. They get beat sometimes, but that's going to happen when you have like a 1,000 reps each each and every single day of practice. They haven't had like the big splash interceptions or or things like that, but I think overall they're doing a good job in coverage. And sometimes with that, no news is good news, especially when it comes to the cornerback situation, because if they're not throwing it your way, it doesn't mean you're not doing a good job. It just means like you're, you're doing a great job because you're covering your guy. They're not throwing it towards you. With that said, I will say that if you were going to rank it out of the three of who's having a good camp and who hasn't, I would probably put Dean at three because I think Carlton has really showed up. He's had some good battles with Mike Evans. Mm. He's won some. He's lost some. Mm. Um, They have him up against Jalen Darden at times. And I know we've spoke about this before on the first day. Jalen Darden burned Carlton Davis deep. But I think that set something off with Carlton where he wasn't going to let that happen again because they well, went it up- did happen again though. It happened oh, it happened today. today? Okay, <laughs> it happened well, today. I can't yeah, speak so the, for today. Uh, at the end for- of the right, at the end of the two minute drill period, uh, Jalen Darden beat Carlton Davis deep for a touchdown from Brady. Perfect throw. Davis had great coverage, and at the last second, Darden kind of like hit a next another gear and kind of leveraged his body, really? like his arm, real subtle. I don't like no way it would have been called. I don't. It wasn't even OPI. It was just. Great technical work getting down on the top of his route and getting in position to make the catch uh, and finish 
for a touchdown in the two minute drill. It was a, it was a, one of the plays of practice, one of the highlights of practice. But in general, what I saw from Carlton and what you've read from Carlton, what everybody seems to be saying about Carlton, yes, Carlton is is still showing out. Yeah, you're always yes. going to give some up as a corner, but he's close on these plays. He's in position. Sometimes you yes. give stuff up. My issue with Dean is that I. I don't know if you can trust him, and I know we're not, we're way ahead of ourselves. Obviously, if he balls out in preseason and plays well early in the season, great. But this is going back to last season, things that he put on tape, on film. I just don't know if I trust him, and I, I definitely trust Ross not to make mistakes, and it feels like Dean makes a lot of them. He did mention today in talking with us that that's one of his focuses is trying to improve his football IQ. I get it. I know he's saying that because the coaches have literally probably said that to him 100 times, mm. and that's what he's supposed to say. But I just don't know. I get, we'll see. Proof will be in the pudding for sure. But I just think Cockrell is a guy that's been a reliable veteran. You're always trying to replace him. But at the end of the day, he always seems like he makes plays and keeps getting better. And he's tough and he's smart. And it's just a lot to really like about him. And I wonder if there's a possibility that he could work his way into the conversation for more playing time if he continues to play as well as he has in practice. I think there's certainly an opportunity there. I mean, we speak about it all the time that Todd Bowles loves versatility. And the Bucks have shown – one that they'll they're willing to give Ross Cockrell opportunities because we saw him get some playing time last season when Sean Murphy Bunting was struggling a little bit. And on the flip side of that, it shows they're not afraid to bench one of their, you know, promising young up and coming players if they don't bring it. You yeah. know, the, the coaches are very, you know, at the I forefront agree. and upright with with things like that. You know, they're gonna put the player on the field that gives them the best chance to win. So I think that combination with Cockrell willing to play safety, if, you know, if they ask him to do that, I think that says a lot about where, you know, they, they trust this guy in multiple different situations. He's already playing in two different spots. So, Hey, I mean, if he can do that, he can certainly make it into the top three in the corners. I, I think a weekend is a little too early to be like, Hey, let's, let's make this move already. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, sure, it's it's something that you could at least monitor. And if Dean really starts to struggle, or if we see in the preseason that he's getting beat on plays that he really shouldn't be, um, I don't think we should be pushing that narrative already. But I I understand your question. It's a fair question to bring up. I I would say it's more just Cockrell dominating out there versus Dean really struggling that badly that there needs to be a yeah. change. But it's today wasn't good, good from Dean. I would I would say it's today not. wasn't great from Dean. Uh, you know, maybe that hasn't been the case all week, and, and that's good. That's good if it hasn't. And he should not be – nothing should be taken away from Dean at this point in time. But maybe it should be – we have un, we have been like Leonard and Rojo is the only competition, yeah. and maybe there's a path for there to be a competition at corner um, if some things were to continue and Cockrell were to play, you know, very, very well in, in, in the postseason – or in the preseason action – uh, that might be a thing. By the way, I think I said Ross Cockrell's wife, according to people in the thing. I don't even know if Ross Cockrell's married. So I have no idea where I got wife. Still a rusty coming back to the pod. I apologize to <laughs> Ross Cockrell's sister, Anna. Uh, that's who qualified for the Olympic 400 meter. By the way, Matt, the finals will be tomorrow night for that. So yes, we'll see if the Bucks get together as a group. I don't know if they can do that kind of thing. Well, of Bruce Aarons actually said today that it's that's right around their curfew. I believe that she's running at 1030. So he said it's right so, around like curfew time. So they can watch it at the hotel, you know, from yeah. the comfort of their, uh, you know, of their hotel rooms. But uh, Ross did say that his parents and his other sister would be watching together. I think they're doing a watch party mm -hmm. uh, at his grandma's or something like that in Louisiana. So uh, she will be well represented within yeah. the family. For sure. Definitely. That's awesome. Other awesome things that happened to practice today outside of the defensive back play. Well, actually, let's not go outside of the defensive back play yet because Jordan Whitehead had a day we'd all be talking about if it hadn't been for Ross Cockrell's kind of magical morning. I mean, Whitehead intercepted a pass from Brady, by the way. So a couple of different things happened on this play. It was really interesting. The Bucks red zone period, the starters went three for six. Brady, we all passes. Brady went three for six in the red zone. That's Pretty good, obviously, percentage, but at the same time, you'd like to see a little bit better. Could have had a little bit of a better percentage. Leonard Fournette dropped two drops today and a false start for Leonard. I don't know yeah. if it's me or what it is. But <laughs> it might just, be you. <laughs> it was literally, I mean, it was Leonard all over again. Like, I really, I wanted the clip so I could put him in the pod and we could bring back the segment. Um, not a good day for Leonard, for sure. Brady actually screamed the cadence at him when Leonard went false start. Didn't quite get in his face, but took a couple steps toward him. Was sending him like he heard what Arian said the day before when Arian said too many mental mistakes. Brady was on guys today. Cyril Grayson messed up a route. 
Brady was on him. You know, he, he ended up Brady ended up throwing into coverage because of it. Uh, wasn't intercepted, but could have been. And Brady was on him right away, telling him, "Here's what you got to do. Here's what you, what you did wrong on your route." And so, yeah, it, this red zone period though, the first one is incomplete to AB back corner of the end zone. It's actually Dean's best play. He was in pretty good coverage on that play. Then touchdown to Gio Bonnie Bernard on an angle route that I think is a sign of of things to come for this Bucks offense. It was beautiful to see. Brought a, brought a small tear to my eye to see the redemption of the running back position. Fournette messed that up later when he dropped what probably would have been a touchdown on the little tunnel screen, um, and uh, that could have been four for six in there. And then the other play was he was intercepted by Whitehead. Uh, it was a blitz, and they ran a stunt. JPP came inside. Haynes, he played center, picked up JPP really well, but JPP kind of anticipated it and kind of like leapt up to, to get in the passing lane and Brady couldn't see really. So he, he kind of just got one out and it was, it was the whitehead and whitehead just caught it right in his gut, right back. So he made a great play there late earlier in the practice. He picked off Gabbert deep. He was going for Jalen Darden. Darden was open a little bit underthrown, I think. And whitehead two eyes safety. He came over, made a great play on the ball. Not the kind of thing we've nest we've talked talk about a lot of the good things with whitehead, Matt. We don't necessarily say that he has this great range and ball skills as a deep right. safety, but man, it was a great play that he made. On actually, it was a pretty good ball, and it was Darden was open by a good bit because he'd beaten the the it was Tampa two, I think, and he beaten one down the seam. And uh, it was a great play by Whitehead, and he made it broke up another pass in the end zone later on a Griffin throw. Um, yeah, he just was all over the place, man. It was an awesome practice, and all of a sudden the Buck safety position, which everybody was like, "What's going on at the beginning of camp?" Because everybody had COVID or was on a list or was hurt <laughs> or something. And now you know it's like, okay, Winfield's back out there. You know he's going to be stud. There goes White Ed. Mike Edwards was all over the place today. Didn't necessarily hit any balls or intercept anything, but made a couple really tough catches. Godwin and Mickens both made really tough catches with Edwards mm. kind of all over them. So. Yeah, I think the safety position is looking pretty decent all of a sudden. Yeah, it's funny how it worked itself out. And uh, I'm, it's awesome everything you're saying about Whitehead because I thought he was really good the first two days when mm. he came back. I was talking earlier about how they eased in guys like uh, Antonio Brown and, and O.J. Howard. That was not the case with Jordan Whitehead. As soon as he was ready to go, they put him right back in there with the first team. And I know that first day uh, he had a pass breakup. I believe it was in the red zone again. So he's just... Uh, Firing yeah. on all cylinders in the red zone. He had a pass breakup of Brady the next day on Saturday or um, yeah, I believe it was Saturday. No, it was Sunday. Okay. Um, he had a, he had another pass breakup. And then as he just said, we, when we say Jordan Whitehead, when we say good things about Jordan Whitehead, it's normally as, you know, making Blitzer. hits and things like yeah, that. Big hits. So uh, there was a pass right over the middle and the receiver caught it. And Whitehead laid his shoulder into him. He didn't like, you know, yeah. if he wanted to light him up, he could have sure. lit him up. But granted, yeah. we're only a couple days in the pads here, so it's still not a crazy amount of tackling or anything like that. But it was good to see Jordan Whitehead hasn't lost his uh, his hard-hitting ability because, in my opinion, Whitehead is one of the last, like, old-school mm -hmm. safeties in terms of uh, he'll hit you, he'll hit you yeah. hard. And, and he's not it. that big? Yeah. He's and you'll hear it. Not, you'll right. hear it anywhere in the field or in the arena that you're at. And then, uh, not to transition too much, but you were just speaking about Edwards. I think Edwards really took full advantage. And granted, it was just like a day with Winfield out, but I think he really took advantage of being the top guy, being the top dog. He likes that leadership role. He was a captain when he was on Kentucky his last mm -hmm. season. I think that's just like a natural feeling for him. Everyone and their mother has been saying that he's a ball hawk mm -hmm. and he's backed it up in the regular season and the postseason last year with all the plays that he's made when, you know, coming in at the right time. It's not like he's playing the whole time and he gets all of these reps to make these pass breakups and interceptions, but right. we've seen it so far in training camp. He had two days in a row where he had an interception. There was one on a deep ball to his good friend, Scotty Miller. He jumped up, made the catch, got the wind knocked out of him. It was a little bit mm -hmm. of a scary moment for a second. Mm -hmm. We weren't sure. Uh, it was so late in practice that, you know, he didn't practice the rest of the day because there's only a couple more plays left. Right. He did come back the next day, had another very nice interception. Uh, I'm really excited about the growth that he's made. In, it's like all know, of a sudden there's all these good safeties and yeah. is there more than one good corner? We don't know. I mean, I'm not saying there isn't, <laughs> but I'm just saying we don't know. And it's like, wow, could Ross Cockrell play corner a little bit more and get him on the field? Could Mike Edwards play safety and maybe Winfield play corner and, I mean, I'm just wow. saying I guarantee Winfield playing the slot, obviously. I guarantee that is something the Bucks coaches are talking about in the 
in, in at least as a plan B because getting more talent on the field is always a priority. Like that's, if you can do it, you, you know, you do it. And so I'm not saying that Cargill's better than SMB or better than Dean or anything like that. I'm saying they saw a lot of those guys struggling last year, played better in the playoffs. I don't think in the playoffs, by the way, they would have hesitated at all had those guys struggled or played like they did in the regular season. Because obviously you got to be quicker on the decisions in the playoffs to yank of one of them and get Cockrell in there and, and go to a plan B. It didn't happen in the playoffs, so we, we're not talking about maybe, but I still think if it happens in the regular season, knowing that they have options and some depth and maybe Winfield can play a little slot and you know SMB can just focus outside or maybe Cockrell can play slot and SMB can just focus outside and Dean can just be the number three guy outside and because they don't really have a true nickel, so it's always been kind of square peg, round hole type of thing yeah. with the nickel spot. In some matchups, that's tough. Some of it isn't, and it's great. Like when Michael Thomas plays in the slot, the Bucks are well suited to be able to defend something like that. When it's Cooper Cup or Robert Woods or you know or uh, Henry Ruggs, even I know he didn't necessarily light it up, but he got open a bunch against the Bucks. Mm -hmm. um, quicker guys, smaller guys like that. It's a tougher matchup. They don't necessarily have great guys, great answers for that matchup. So finding one could be a theme of the offseason, and maybe those got safeties guys have uh, something to do with it. I want to go ahead. Oh, I was go just going to say, and why not? If you got all these different pieces that are all talented and can help you win football games, why not mix it up and put in yeah. different scenario situations? It's only going to help your team and make it more confusing for the opposing offense. I right. mean, we saw last year there was a time where, you know, it was a third down play, and Dom Kinsu was lined up essentially with the linebackers just to get a running start on a pass yeah. rush, you right. know? Is that, I mean, maybe it won't confuse you, but it'll certainly take you off guard or lose your focus for a second yes. when you see Sue lined up next to Levante David like that. Yeah, so absolutely. why not if you could do something like that with the secondary, whether it's moving Winfield to corner or having Cockrell play corner mm -hmm. on one play and then safety the next play, you know, yeah. throw everything off with at the quarterback there. There's yeah. so many different little things that the Bucks defense can do. It makes it very exciting heading into the season. It does. It makes it a lot of fun and it'll be make especially because they made so many changes late in the year last year. Now we don't know what their new normal will be. We we yeah. after watching them in the postseason, we don't know what their new normal will be. And there will be a, there was a lot more two high safeties today than I can't necessarily remember seeing a lot of last year. And so it'll be something to monitor moving forward. Scott Federico says John with Tryon likely pushing Nelson down the depth chart. Uh, you could take out the word likely. Joe Tryon had a great <laughs> camp for sure. Uh, does Nelson have the frame, leverage, and power to add 10 to 20 pounds to possibly succeed Golson at five tech? It's a good question, Scott. First, I'll say generally that five tech's kind of a dead position. Uh, the Bucks are in base defense so little that it it doesn't really matter. Like it's not really worth like Golson wouldn't be worth a roster spot in today's NFL if the Bucks hadn't seen. A, he can play three technique and be a good run defender uh, when they go to nickel alignments, which they're in most of the time anyway. Or B, Golson can can it can't be or isn't an asset rushing the passer. If he weren't an asset or asset rushing the passer, then again that would kind of kill his value. So you really just have to be good at those two things, and it doesn't. It, Golson doesn't really even play that much five tech to be honest anymore. Like it's just not the way teams line up as much uh, in today's NFL. So. I would still say Anthony Nelson would need to be basically a great three technique or a great interior rusher for him to make any type of position switch. Those are the really the important things. Can Anthony Nelson stop the run as a three technique uh, inside uh, because that's where his value would be attached to as a roster spot? I don't see that being uh, because Nelson is a pretty good run stopper as a defensive end or an edge defender, you know, so. Just keep him there. Um, and the other part of it is, you know, is he a great inside pass rusher? We've seen basically no evidence of this so far in his career. I know there was hope about it because of his length. Um, maybe he can bulk up. I mean, he's already a pretty big dude, but maybe he could bulk up and maybe he's better inside because of it. I, I think it really is about quickness inside more than it is about power. Um, pa quickness, if you're going to be an inside pass rusher, you want to be able to cross guards' faces. They're not as quick. They're not as long-armed inside. They have less degree, less room for error, basically, if they um, if they miss a strike against you, if they don't have athleticism, if they miss their punch uh, because you outreached them or because you are quicker than they were, there's harder for them to recover because they usually don't have the same athleticism length. And you see Donovan Smith. It's not always technically perfect, right? But he's an right. offensive tackle, and sometimes he can push the guy by or he can recover because he's a good athlete in that space it's usually less likely to be the case for, for guards and centers inside. So that's where I'd want to see Nelson kind of have traits that suggest he can move inside. I don't really see that with him. So I would say it's pretty unlikely that he ever position switches unless there's some crazy physical transformation that I'm not anticipating uh, at this time with him. He 
has he, what has Anthony Nelson done for you? Have you seen anything? I know he's one of the questions going into camp, but Cam Gill has been out for like five practices now. He was out again today. It's a big opportunity for Nelson. I didn't notice him today. Yeah. So I would say for Nelson, the first couple days of practice, God bless you. Uh, it was very, very quiet. Didn't see too much. Didn't struggle, but mm-hmm. didn't come up with any of those big impact type of plays. And then over the weekend, he was able to turn it on a little bit more. He had a sack against Brady on on Saturday. No, sorry, on Sunday. I got my notes here. I got I, first of all, my days just all just blend into each other. Are you going to sneeze again? I thought I was going to, but it was okay. a false alarm. Your so, days, my I there were like two nights in a row where I didn't sleep. My day, I have no clue what happened <laughs> on any day this weekend. Yeah, but um, Nelson had a sack against Brady, so I think that you know that's important, mm-hmm. or a would be sack as right. we like to call it. Because uh, no one can touch the quarterback, but um, he did have a, a good play there. He had another pass rush where he didn't get to the quarterback, but he forced the quarterback to to make an errant throw. And um, so I think we've we've seen him take a step in the right direction. I think the problem for him more than anything else is that Joe Tryon has just looked so great, and he's getting to the mm-hmm. quarterback. And you see, one of my favorite drills in training camp is when. So all the pads come on and you just do offensive line versus defensive line, one-on-one pass rushing opportunities. And Tryon's first rep, I mean, he got to the quarterback in like a half a second, did a little move to to pin the lineman's arm down and bend and get by him. It was just like, if you blinked, you would have missed it. And that was after he had already made big plays on the field, getting to the quarterback or, forcing the quarterback to move up in the pocket so Khalil Davis can get a sack. I think Nelson has done okay. As I said, he did better over the weekend, and I think that's more encouraging if you you pick it up as the pads come on, which is Mm -hmm. one thing Bruce Aarons talks about, that everyone looks good in shorts. Who looks good when the pads come on? He definitely took a step forward with that. But again, because of Tryon, just one being the the number one pick for the Bucs and the camp that he's putting on, it's very clear it's going to be three and four trying on Nelson yes. when the season comes around. Yeah, very, very clear to me. I think that Tryon looked really good today. It wasn't quite – I wish we would have had one-on-ones. We didn't have any offensive line, defensive line one-on-ones today. Oh, man. I- I'm hopeful for that. Have there been any this so far? Like, Yeah, so the other day they had – Tristan Wirfs did two reps in a row. He went up against JPP, and then he went up against Shaq. And both of those – Great reps. I called it a draw because, you know, they, they obviously mm-hmm. didn't get right past yeah. Tristan Wirfs, but they were definitely moving him back and back. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'd call it a stalemate in that sense. Mm-hmm. Um, who else? I was who just curious if, if uh, because Joe Tryon, I didn't get to see him in that environment. So, yeah, yeah Tryon been- had a rep. A lot of it was the backups, but Tryon had a great rep. Uh, Khalil Davis had two reps against Ali Marpet and defeated him both times. What? Okay, yeah. hold on. That's huge. I mean, I've said this before, but I think Khalil Davis's development as really the only developmental piece on the entire interior defensive yeah. line at this point is like low-key kind of a big storyline because right now they have fine answers if somebody got hurt in terms of run defense. They have like no answers in terms of pass rush depth as an interior defensive line. Yeah, and I think Davis, uh, we saw in his press conference the other day, he was talking about, yeah, I understand that all of last season was essentially a redshirt year for me, which you don't see in the NFL at all. And he said he really worked hard at the things that he struggled with the season before. And I'm sure getting off with the the pass rush was probably one of those things that he worked on the most. I mean, to beat someone like Ali Marpet, who's one of the best offensive linemen that the Bucs have, I mean, that's a huge statement. And then Davis had a sack. It was on the play where Tryon got around the corner. He pushed the quarterback up, yeah. and Davis was there for the sack. Now, granted, you could say maybe that was Tryon's play, and Davis was the beneficiary of it. Huh. But, hey, right place, right time. I think Davis has been solid in stopping the run. There was, at one point over the weekend, it was Davis, Benning, and uh, Sam Renner, who they were just clogging everything up in the middle at the line of scrimmage. The running back had nowhere to go, no hole to hit, and they were just doing their thing down there. I think it's a great competition with the with the backups for the defensive line. We obviously know who the main guys are, but Sam Renner, first guy out on the field today. Yeah, I I saw you tweet that. So there you go. Working working on the sled a little bit, you know, 
getting his mind right. I was like, all right, all right. I mean, I that's know what you got to do, first. man. I mean, he yeah. knows he's a bubble guy. Everyone yep. knows it. You got to do anything you can to stand out against your competition. And if it that's means true. you're the first guy out there yep. getting more reps than everyone else, that's what you got to do to make this team. That's a good point. The last guy out there has been Raven Green, right? I mean, he was he was not he was the MIA for a while. Now he's here, and yeah, I didn't notice him at all today, Ben. To be honest with you, I didn't see him one time make a play or anything like that. Uh, so we'll have to keep monitoring him. Obviously, the opportunity is there, but it's pretty clear at this point in time. Cockrell is the number four safety. He's running with the number four, as the number four safety um, almost exclusively right now. So already that's, you know, uphill battle for Raven Green a little bit. Special teams will be where he has to make his mark. Um, don't think he was out there on the first kickoff coverage team uh, today either. So we'll see what happens with Raven Green. He missed some time and he's going to have to stand out in preseason probably to get those opportunities with the first team special teams unit. Um, that's usually how these things work. And so if he can prove himself in the game, that can happen quickly. Remember, we're still lots of time until the season. Yes. But so far, we've seen very little from Raven Green at this point in time. I don't know if I can even write about this, but back to the Joe Tryon thing really quick. I don't know if we get yelled at for saying these things or not. I don't think so. They're usually pretty chill. I, it probably doesn't mean anything really. But Joe Tryon, Shaq Barrett, Dominican Sue, Vita Vea, Jason Pierre-Paul, all out on the field at once together on the defensive line. Pretty cool. I was like, oh, what's yeah. this? And then Barrett dropped, I think, and they made her in a game with Tryon and Sue, and Je Devin White might have blitzed on that play, I think, and it was interesting. I don't know. I would have to see I feel bad now. for all the other yeah. teams that have to play the Bucs this year. Right, right. Somebody yeah. asked about Ronald Jones catching the football. I've got nothing from today. He caught it in individuals. Fine, no drops there. In game or team period practices, parts of practice, Geo caught a couple balls. Keyshawn Vaughn caught a ball. Um, uh, Pro Size caught a ball. I'm trying to even oh Troy Main Pope caught a ball. Leonard dropped two and caught one or uh, caught two maybe. Um, I didn't see. I don't think Ronald Jones got targeted today. I mean, I watch every rep pretty closely and take notes. I don't think Ronald Jones got thrown a ball to in a team period. I don't take notes on. I don't take that kind of notes. Right. On individual. Yeah. In eleven on eleven and seven on sevens, Rojo has gotten some targets his way not mm. a ton and yeah. I, I don't necessarily know if that's because of the history of rojo being able to catch passes it's a little it's been a little bit of the same in terms of he's made some catches and you're like all right i think this is it he's turned the corner he could be a full-time receiving back now and then he'll make a drop or he'll make a drop in you know when the running backs are not going up against anyone and they're just warming up yeah. and he makes a drop and you're like ah um, I honestly think it's, I really like Rojo. I, I, I kind of lean towards him to be the number one back, uh, with, with the, the style that he has when he's running and mm -hmm. uh, very much a momentum guy. I just think at this point, it is what it is with him as a, as a receiving back. He can, he can catch the ball, but it's not guaranteed that he's going to make the catch <laughs> every single time. I just, I just think we have to live there with could it. Be a healthy percentage of the time where the ball hits the ground. I just think we have to live with it, and that's why you have Gio Bernard, right? And part <laughs> again, part of it's it's right, it's, and part of it's it's not just drops; it's also known where to be in the past game. So it is something we need to monitor with him for sure. I would say it's just something we don't yet have an answer to in the preseason. Hopefully, we'll. I mean, that's the time where if he drops every one, you don't care in the preseason. You just know yeah. he's not going to play in the regular season if he does that. So that's kind of where you uh, put the emphasis on it uh, is in the preseason. Um, yeah, this was a practice that uh, good to hear about Khalil Davis because I didn't. This was a practice where I really the skill players really stole the show. Secondary players that I mentioned already, and then the wide receiver group was unbelievable. I wrote about this in the practice report. If you get a chance to read it, check it out over at pewterreport.com. I go into more detail there than I probably will hear. But what a day, man! I mean, uh, every dude on the roster basically. I mean, I'm mean, it played in practice as a wide receiver, made an unbelievable catch today. I mean. Cam, I mean, uh, TJ Simmons, deep, deep pass from Kyle Trask, beat Nate Brooks for a touchdown. Um, Travis Johnson, two deep yeah. touchdowns. Yeah, John, I was going to say, these backup receivers have really been making a name for themselves. Obviously, it's, it's going to be very tough for them to make the team. But yeah, Pearson, Josh Pearson, I don't, you just mentioned Simmons there. So Josh Pearson, Travis Johnson, and TJ Simmons, they have all been putting in the work, man. And it sucks because obviously one of them or maybe all of them are going to be the odd man out because this team is so talented, but they deserve a shout out, man, because yeah. they've been bringing it and they've built really good chemistry with Ryan Giff Griffin and Kyle Trask. Um, 
they're getting open over the middle. They're getting open in in very different ways. That's and awesome. I mean, um, Jaden Mickens not being able to make this roster, Matt. That's like if if that's the case, as we think it is now. Uh, that's that's tough. I mean, he has played awesome. He played awesome in minicamp. He was unbelievable today. He made several great catches. Um, he got lit up by Mike Edwards, a super tight window. He hung onto the ball, made like an amazing sliding catch and like on an out route. I mean, it, on an over route. It was just – he had an awesome day, and it's like, I, you know, Jalen Darden was amazing. Tyler Johnson's yeah. out here catching passes. Wow, and- Tyler Johnson, man, made a one-handed catch yesterday. It was insane. Like corner yeah. of the end zone. Can't see my hand. They were like made the one catch right. and then like – Brought it together with the other one. It was shout out to Tyler Johnson. I mean, he got ripped by Bruce Arians again for coming into camp overweight. But I mean, on the field, he's really? making the ca- yeah the other that. day. That's yeah. funny. I thought Arians I'd seen all asked, the quotes, but I missed that. Yeah, Arians was asked how's Tyler Johnson look, and pretty much one of the first thing he said was he came. Uh, yeah, like he came in, uh, you know, out of shape. That's mm-hmm. his fault. And then oh, out of shape, like, I saw. Yeah, I didn't yeah. see overweight. <laughs> maybe yeah, was, maybe that was it. Out of shape. Okay, but, yeah. um yeah, he kind of ripped into Tyler Johnson there. Yeah. He ripped into um, he ripped into Scotty Miller on Scotty Miller's birthday. He was saying that Scotty needs to make the grimy catches mm. um, because obviously we know he can go down the field. But he said that's he can't true be, though. Oh, can't be a one trick pony. And I will say, Scotty came out the next day and was making those grimy catches. Mm-hmm. He was making catches over the middle. He's making diving catches, uh, some one on one work when it was him against the corner. He was. I don't think – is it that Scotty doesn't make grimy catches or is that nobody's close enough to him for him to make grimy catches? I just catches don't think he really he gets-, gets a lot of attempts. Yeah. Like in exactly right. on passes that are – Caught, the one, just, the, just caught the one in the, the Vikings field. game when that guy was all over his back. There was definite pass interference when they caught that. I don't know. I, I mean, he. what about the Saints catch? He's about to get lit up. That was pretty grimy. That was a big time play. I don't know. I mean, I get what he's saying though. Like yeah. if you want to be a complete receiver, you got to be able to make combat catches too. But like, heck, Scotty's never gonna make combat catches. Like, why would right. he need to? He's five yards past people most of the time. That so same, I, yeah. yeah, that same press conference though, he was very like. So he ripped those guys, but he was very complimentary about Keyshawn Vaughn. He was like, Keyshawn is spot on. He's looked great. He's doing great as a receiver. <laughs> so it's just funny, like who he picks and chooses to. I'm I mean, not obviously, saying he's wrong. Maybe he's right. I just have I mean, I granted, like the people are, people are asking him questions. So it's not like he's, you know, how Arians will go to the mic and yeah. before he entertains questions, he'll be like, yeah, thought practice was good today or thought mm-hmm. practice was bad. It wasn't like he started that and then said, and just Tyler Johnson and Scotty yeah. Miller. It wasn't like he went out of his way. Exactly. I mean, right. he has to answer the question that was asked to him. Yeah. But it was kind of funny to see he was. Not very happy with those guys, and then he gets a question about Keyshawn Vaughn and singing his praises and everything like that. So, yeah. um, well, it's funny. I mean, I didn't again, there's not much more pointless than watching a running back in training camp or any practices, really. It just <laughs> unless they're talking about the receiving game or uh, mental stuff, you know, just to, did they drop the ball, like things like that. Like, I mean, watching them run is point. the most important things for a back in terms of running the ball. I, once you get the basic principles down, which I'm not going to be able to tell from a training camp live practice in terms of reads, but is is whether they make people miss or whether they break tackles. <laughs> and we can't yeah. tell either of those things when there is a tackle. Like so, yeah, it's there will be very few observations about the running backs other than in the receiving game until camp. So maybe isn't it, gone, or preseason games. Isn't it crazy? Like there's a game in three days from now, the like oh. the Hall of Fame game, the Cowboys and Steelers. First of all, I love awesome. it, but I just I can't imagine you know, just seeing the Bucks practice and yeah, there's hitting now and there's full pads, but there's not full, yeah. you know, wrapping up tackles and stuff like that. I can't even imagine going to play in three days with like very little hitting going on. And now yeah. you're going to have guys tackling for, for four quarters and stuff like that. For sure. You know, it's interesting because I don't, I think the Steelers have been pr- practicing in pads tackling like for example i know that some teams are just going to camp so but the steelers have won because they play in the, in the game in three days they've been going live and, and actually that's tackling. true i mean the cowboys and steelers right. could be doing but i don't know if the different. are the bucks going to do that at some point i mean is that going to happen i'm sure they will okay i was going to say i this is my first time covering the bucks so i didn't know if they yeah. had some policy no they, they have in the past okay they have in the past but so um, we'll see it at some point i did not see any ta- any like live tackling today at all there are a couple of times guys go to the ground but in the run yeah. periods, really, they didn't have leg pads on. The leg pads were optional today. Jaden Mickens wore them, though. 
There's the thing about Jaden Mickens. I know this stuff off the field that happened in the spring, all that I get it, but he's one of the most popular guys on this team. So like within hit the teammates or just yes. yeah. Okay, yes. I I, yes. I think that's fair. And I've heard that from several people, and it's obvious whenever he does something. Like everybody goes nuts when Jaden Mickens does something. He's a morale guy, he comes in, he chirps, he's funny, he's teaching Jalen Darden how to play the position that he yeah, knows is gonna cost him a job. You know what I mean? Like He's one of those guys that everybody loves on this team. He's part of the Washington pipeline too, yeah. with Via yeah. and Tryon yep. and Benning. He's and grimy. Everyone. He's tough. He can play multiple receiver spots. He's gotten better and better and better as a receiver. He's obviously a return guy. He's done some special teams. He's been a gunner. I'm not saying he's great at it. I'm just saying he's a gunner. <laughs> you know, he's willing to do anything for the team. Yeah, he really is. So, I mean, today he caught at the end of a two minute drill. He caught a long touchdown from Gabbert. Scored. And this was, they were taking us media out off the bleachers because we were in the indoor and we were walking and I missed like no plays. Like, you know, it's like, I'm anal, like, I missed. Yeah. Like, were I you sprinting every- behind the, uh, the back of the facility? <laughs> so basically, yeah, basically that's what I'm trying <laughs> to do. So I'm coming down off the bleachers and I'm like turned for a second while we're walking in the other direction. And of course that's the play dart that Mick and scores on. Yeah. Well, I just turned around a whole, all, everybody on the team, the offense is running 80 yards down the field to the end zone to celebrate with Mickens. Mike Evans leading the way, going nuts. You know, it's in the middle. I'm like, is that the last play of practice? Because I'm like, it's a little bit early. And it wasn't. It was just they were that excited because Mickens did this. I mean, they just love – they're just huge Mickens fans. Everybody loves them. And, you know, Darden caught a touchdown a couple minutes later from Brady, like in the front corner of the end zone. was probably a more high-degree difficulty play. And, like, everybody's like, yeah, good job, Darden. But it was like, (laughs) hey, why aren't y'all – why aren't y'all running down? Do it again so, now, rookie. You know that's right. <laughs> yeah, so they just really like Mickens, and I just wonder at the end of the day if there's some if the he may ends up making a case it's for like that the Pat O'Connor effect. Yeah. You know, everyone loves Pat O'Connor, so that's probably bought him some more time than yeah. just being good at special teams. That, it's probably a good point, and the fact that Cockrell can maybe take a fourth safety spot and give you another gunner. Bruce Arians mentioned that, and that could be Mickens. I mean, I'm not saying it yeah. will be. He's, but there's not a lot of proven gunners on this team. And exactly. So there's just a possibility that if Mickens proves himself enough that he's going to be, I don't know. It's it's tricky to figure out how he gets into the equation. If somebody gets hurt, it's easy. But if right now right. It's, it's tricky. But and again, we're a week in. Like so much right. more can happen by the time right. September 9th gets here. People asking about Justin Watson. Remember, he's out for uh, really the whole November, season, basically, yeah. Yeah, probably the season. He could be back at the end, right end of the regular season or playoffs if they need him. We'll see. But yeah, uh, was it a shoulder? And now I'm trying. Now I can't remember. Yeah, <laughs> all the ago. injuries run together this time. Yeah, you're about injuries. Once you're kind of injured now for the season, like all right, well, right, it's know, like all right, I got we'll other things on. to focus on. <laughs> no events, Jordan. Justin yeah, no, 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 that that's for anyone, you know. Yeah, uh, the, Am- Emily wants to know about thoughts about what Jerry Jones had to say. I'll be honest, I didn't see all the quotes. I know Scott did a story over a Peter report. I saw that there was a David versus Goliath comparison, and I believe he was calling the Bucks Goliath. Which, if people tuned in. A year ago, and that happened, or two years ago, maybe, and that happened, they would have said, Well, I mean, the, the Cowboys are, you know, typically considered that. But I guess if you look at postseason recent records, no question about it, right? I mean, geez, they've, yeah. uh, they've really I mean, struggled, it, and the Bucks are on their way up. It's just funny because Jerry Jones is always like glowingly confident about the Cowboys, even when things are like pretty ugly for them you know i mean like he he'll be like yeah we need to make changes if they need to make changes but yeah i don't think ever in his history of owning the cowboys has he been like yeah we're the underdogs going into week one you don't really see right. that too much with uh jerry jones but you know what yeah he's right the cowboys are underdogs going to this game and i've been yeah. on the record i'll keep saying it the bucks are going to win by double digits in the home opener I hope you're right, but uh, it was a patella tendon, by the way, for Watson, according to Abuzar. I mean, uh, yeah, um, I hope you're right. I will say this on paper. Oh, buddy. There's, you know, things never work out this way. So I hate to even say it, but the Bucks receivers and offensive weaponry going up. The current state of the Cowboys secondary. I'm not saying they won't be good eventually. Just. This is like a totally new group trying to play together for the first time with a ton of young guys and some guys haven't necessarily had the best camps and uh, it's just a lot. It's asking a lot. That's all I know. Uh, it's asking a lot. So we'll see what happens. It, it really goes down like it looks on paper, but uh, it could. It could for sure. Mr. Bucks Nation, by the way, who is in the chat. I see you, Mr. Bucks Nation. We yeah. thank you 
For we love this Bucks Nation. Jack. He was giving me a shout. Like, he was texting me like as I was on the sideline watching, because he was there. And he was texting me while I'm on the sideline being like, yeah. you're doing a great job. So you're the man, Mr. Box Nation. And he was, I be- I asked him today in passing, he was down at training camp practice and he was, you know, behind, he was with us in the media and he was out there, but then the lightning oh, was just inside and we're tier two. And so right. only tier two can go inside. And so Mr. Box Nation was like, I was felt so bad. I was like, oh, he comes down for practice and he gets yeah. his credential. But oh, he'll be damn, back. He'll I didn't be know back. that. Yeah, he'll be back. Oh, he'll sorry he'll be that. back with the credential. He'll get an opportunity to see a full practice outside. And I'm, I'm very excited for him. Joel says, uh, Mr. Bucks Nation, I love your shows. We all do. We all do, Joel. Yes, we do. Um, okay, so in this practice, uh, there weren't a ton of – a couple other observations that I want to make sure I get to. But first, we got to talk about our friends over at Manscaped, Matt. Well, you know, one of the things that I had the pleasure of doing, I, you know, it was a gift to this groom that at this wedding I was at. I said, here, my, my guy, look, you're going to need this Manscaped Performance Package 4.0. And that's what I'm about. I'm about that performance package 4.0 life. We all are over at pewterreport.com. Yep. Got to give him some amazing products that I know will bless him in wonderful, beautiful ways. And that's what we're about for all of you. We want you to experience the same thing with Manscaped. The performance package 4.0 is a game changer, folks. The 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 trimmer is unbelievable. The light on it, no nicks and snags, things like that. Um, the fact that it's waterproof, there's a travel lock on it. It's smooth, it's comfortable, uh, it's amazing to use. And you've got so many other things in the package as well. You've got the deodorant and uh, the crop preserver, and then you've got the the boxers that are the, yes. the most comfortable things Love I've boxers. ever. Like it is, it's a perfect gift. It's great. If you don't have it, ask for it. Um, it just is. It's great, guys. You the want travel to this, bag. The, the travel, travel bag, bag it comes is awesome with. too. I mean, I. I listen, I've got a little shrine. I mean, I've got the Manscaped shrine going on right now in the bathroom. It just look I got all these products and I mean, I just have been so thrilled and pleased with all the products. Um it's game changer type of stuff. So guys, get yourself some, ask for it as a gift, give it to somebody else as a gift, spread the news and by the way, you can do this by going to Manscaped and using the promo code Pewter and you get 20% off right now. Use the promo code Pewter, 20% off. In free shipping with that promo code, you can't beat it. They've got unbelievable deals going on as it is at Manscaped. They always do. So go check out manscaped.com. Stop putting off getting the gift for somebody else. Stop putting off getting it for your asking for it for yourself. And just let somebody know, hey, this is what I want. Because really deep down, it's what all of us want. It really is, guys. So get yourself uh, some Manscaped today by going over to manscaped.com and using that promo code pewter, P-E-W-T-E-R. All right, Matt. Uh, I wanted to point this out before we got off the show because we mentioned it a little bit. I think Jalen Darden might be really good. I, and I don't want to like go crazy yet about how good, but he's just open all the time. And I've seen what you've said and I watch mini camp and I watch guys all the time. Remember everybody's always like, Oh, it's been one practice. And I get that. But like, I also watch football players every year, all year mm-hmm. round for scouting and things like that. And I've done this for years and you can tell the way a guy moves at times and even the way the guy catches the ball away from his body, I know he has had some drops, but that's everybody. I just think he might be really good. Like he's not just a small, fast guy. He's technically good. Right. He catches outside his frame. He knows how to get position and he's tough over the middle of the field. And I've just seen a lot of really, really good things from him. And that's before he even gets the ball in his hand. But yeah, he just looks so, I know he's a rookie, but he looks so comfortable out there. You know, it, it's like watching. It's it's like watching like a well-tuned orchestra or like poetry in motion, as they call it, or just like just the way he's so fluid with everything, man. It's just like he can't go up against the third and fourth string corners because he just yep. burns them like it's right. not even close. It's not even remotely close. He's burning Carlton Davis, as we spoke yep. about, like he's equally matched going up against the ones and twos and like. I mean, today Jamel he beat Dean. Jamel Dean and he beat yeah. Carl Davis. Those were his two best. Like he's beating today. those guys. He's dismantling and destroying any of the, you know, the reserve corners that are trying to make it. He I mean, he basically super- broke D Delaney's leg today. Yeah, he was- he just he looks extremely comfortable out there. He's getting open. Like yes, he has the speed and he could just beat you in a straight shot down the field on a go route. But he can beat you in so many different ways. He could beat you just running a little five yard out, getting the yep. ball, and then turning up field. He can beat you over the middle. He's He's really taken initiative with with nailing these routes and, and understanding them and understanding yeah. when to look, when to know when the ball's coming your way. 
He's been so impressive so far, just a week in that, uh, you know, he, he was the fourth round pick, but he can end up being the top rookie in this draft class when the season's done because Tryon has to play behind guys like Shaq and JPP and receivers different. You can still get your opportunities, even with great yes. receivers on this team. But and then he gets the ball in his hands and he's a whole different weapon with that too. He's such well, an that's part we don't even we we know it from college, but we haven't even seen that because there's not like live tackling. Yeah, guys are pulling up, but that's something a whole another element. He's impressing us without even being able to see what was arguably his best trait so far. We haven't seen that at all. So I think he's going to be, you know, like, and I'm not making this comparison because it's so early, but you know, when the chiefs will like purposely run a screen play or just like a three, like a little three yard pass to Tyreek Hill. And then it's like, all right, he's got blockers downfield. What is he going to do? Oh my God. He's a threat to the end zone. Anytime he has the ball. I'm not saying that's the case with Darden, right? but I get that feeling when he has the ball. It's like, okay, if he could just make one or two guys mm-hmm. miss, He's going to take it to the house. I think he brings a whole new element to this Bucks offense that you don't necessarily get with some of the other guys. You see it a little bit with AB, and that's why we've gotten the comparisons of AB and Jalen Darden. Mm-hmm. I think this guy can really be something special for this team and and really be that that X factor and yeah. reliable yeah. guy. If he can start making catches and stops jumping off sides, there's been a lot of positive, a little bit of negative. He can if he can clean up the yeah. catches. Which I think he will because he makes all the negative real catches normal. too. Right. Like he'll catch, yeah. he'll he'll make a drop, but then he'll go and make a a catch in the corner of the end zone that not many people could go make. So um, right, and I all mean, the negative guy, has been, been normal, awesome, right? Like all the negative is like stuff you know is going to happen with a rookie. Yeah, player. and that's what Bruce said too. Yeah, it's, right. it's rookie stuff. It's rookie stuff. But in terms of like movement ability and is is his size a factor? Is he getting beat up? Where's he? Is he winning physically? When you're knocking Carlton Davis off balance at the top of the route without clear and egregious without anything really illegal yeah i'm gonna be okay like and when you can play outside like that that's what they're trying to do that's why he's up against carlton so often he's their best press corner they want darden to play outside that's where they want his future to be yeah and so can he get off press coverage against those guys well so far i mean that was the big question coming out of minicamp and i man i think darden is answering so it's just been really impressive start Um, we'll see obviously we have a lot more to learn um, just seeing how in place he's looked so far has been really encouraging because I mm. didn't scout a ton of him in college. And what I saw, I was like, all right, he's just clearly a better athlete than everybody else out there. I don't know whether that's going to carry over in the NFL or not. So he's been a surprise to me. I will go so far as to say that. What else was kind of a surprise to me today? And again, I don't want to make it sound like we're blowing up every rookie here, but like uh, because we already raved about Tryon and Darden, but I mean, it was a pretty good day for. Robert Hainsey, because he was running first team offense. Like I said, he made good blocks all day. I didn't think he was an issue. The snaps, one bad snap late in the in the in the practice, but mostly good snaps. It looked like um, so good for him uh, and good start for him. We'll learn more about him. When we get to more one on one periods, I think. But Cal Trask, I mean, he hardly got any reps today. But let me tell you, Matt, I mean, he let it rip deep a couple times, and it was. On the money, beautiful throws. Travis Johnson, TJ Simmons. I know he's working against the backup defense, but remember, he's got backups on offense too. Some great throws, and it was on a day where Ryan Griffin was terrible. Friend of the pod, love him. But my gosh, I mean, he had three opportunities in the end zone. One was well covered by Whitehead. He threw wide to Jarrell Adams. Uh, Wasn't an accurate throw. TJ Simmons beat Jamel Dean to the back of the end zone. And... He missed him just several yards behind him. Bad throw. Then he threw to Ross Cockrell and picking, picked him off on the crossing route. Then he comes back. His very next pass is in a 77, I believe, and Cockrell picks him off again, this time at safety. Then he comes back. He's holding the ball. He's holding the ball. He's holding the ball. He's holding the ball. O.J. Howard late. He tried to force it to him. Javon Hagan was already breaking on it because he knew he was going to check down. The whole thing, he would have been sacked on a real game, but it was mm-hmm. – then Hagan drops an interception. He he juggled it and ripped it away kind of and juggled it and dropped it. Um, just a terrible decision. Um, then he completed one on an out route to a running back, but that was like it for Griffin for the day. So two interceptions and six pass attempts, uh, another drop That's surprising because he's, he's, he's had a pretty good camp so far, I would say, for you know what you would expect from – well, Ryan Gabbard Griffin. wasn't good either, and I think Gabbard's been okay, right, during camp. I mean, Gabbard yeah, it was just a day for picks. I mean, Gabbard threw three picks. 
rough day all around for the backup quarterbacks, except for Trask and his limited opportunities. Brady was amazing today, but we say that almost as a footnote to this yeah. podcast because <laughs> we just expect that Brady was unbelievable. I mean, it was in command, throws, everything. He was freaking phenomenal. Um, but Gabbert, uh, yeah, Gabbert, he made some throws, but he, I mean, through a lot of interceptions, a couple draw. Uh, there was a dropped interception at the goal line. It was mm. wide open in the flat. Just no, you never should miss the throw. First read, uh, it was wide open. Travis Johnson and he just underthrew it badly. I think Antonio Hamilton dropped the pick. Um, White had picked him off. Oh no, sorry, no. White had picked Brady and you know, Cockrell picked him off later in practice on on an interception where he's going to the ground. That was Cockrell. Um, so yeah, he just. Not a good day for him at all either. Um, so that's probably, if we're talking negative things, those are two of the few things that come out of today's practice. The picks are coming in bunches, man. They are. The it's kind of crazy. That doesn't always happen in camp. The Bucks are making, they're opportunistic. The defense yeah. lost today for sure, but they were still very opportunistic. Yeah, I mean, the other day they had, on Saturday, they had four interceptions. And then today they obviously had a lot as well too. So... <laughs> I, I think what we've seen so far in this training camp is, and essentially what Bruce Arians talks about a lot too, is, you know, both sides are going to win. You know, <laughs> this is a really good team for a reason. Both sides are, are going to win. And um, sounds right. like today wasn't really the defense's day besides Ross Cockrell, but, uh, you know, you're, you're going to have those. Whitehead moments. and Whitehead. Yeah. Oh, yes, and Whitehead. Yeah, and Whitehead. Sorry. Those guys were good. Yeah. But yeah, definitely an offensive day. Update on Brady's arm. Max wants to know. We'll answer that in a second. First, I got to let you know, all, all know about Briar Greaves. Our, our friends over at Briar Greaves have been in business for over 30 years because they're doing something right. They do a lot of things right, actually. And one of them is giving exceptional personal service to their insurance customers. We all need insurance, whether it's life, homeowners, auto, or even commercial insurance. Briar and Sam and their staff are the best in the area and big Bucks fans. It will take you 10 minutes to get a quote or compare your current policy and that 10 minutes could turn into hundreds of dollars in savings. Give them a call today, 813-876-4166. Pick up the phone as soon as this pod wraps up. Give these guys a call. Tell them Pewter Report sent you and guess what? You want to see what your insurance, see if you can save hundreds of dollars. It doesn't cost you anything to do it. Just pick them up, give them a call and see if you can save money that way. Who, could, who doesn't want to know if they can save money that way? I definitely do. So Find out how much money you can put back in your pocket. 30 years in the business, buck season ticket holders. If you can't talk, if you can't save anything on insurance, you have a good bucks conversation with them. Call Briar or Sam today. Can. Find out about your insurance. Uh, Brady's arm. There's really an update other than that. It looks awesome. One thing that I thought was really interesting, uh, Paul Atwell, uh, who writes for us as a contributor, obviously, and does a terrific job, did an awesome piece where he interviewed a longtime quarterbacks expert, mechanics expert, and asked him what, will change for Brady or what did Brady have to change last year because of that torn MCL when he was throwing on it? What does he have to change moving forward? Or what did he change last year that may have affected him? One of the things he said was the hardest thing to throw probably were out routes. Well, that kind of sent off alarm bells for me because there were a couple out route interceptions and even yep. a dropped interception, I believe in the playoffs, Marshawn Lattimore uh, dropped what could have been a pick six, I believe. Um, seemed like that was a tougher throw for him. They threw him less too as the year went on. I don't know whether it's a sign of things to come or an indication of anything, but he was ripping that throw today in practice. Several out routes to AB, perfect on the sideline, even to the running backs out there. It was a big throw all practice. I mean, he was it was standing out that he was ripping that throw. I don't think it was an arm strength issue last year. Could have been a timing issue. Maybe the process was slower of adjusting to get out there because of the knee last year. His arm strength's never been in question. I think he's going to be able to throw that route more effectively this year because of the surgery. Yeah, I haven't seen any drop off with Brady's arm strength at all. If anything, like there was a couple where he overthrew Scotty Miller, which obviously you're not going to have to worry about the arm strength if that's the case, if he's overthrowing him. I just want to say there was one pass that he had yesterday. Uh, it's on the Bucks social media as well, too, so you can see it. But the deep ball he had to Mike Evans where Mike, his arms were outstretched, and he essentially like caught it with his fingertips, was one of the most insane plays that i've seen ever, since i've ever watched training camp it was truly unreal so uh go over to the buck social media and yeah. and see that because it was like it was one of those jaw dropping dropping plays yeah. where and yeah. the fans go crazy when mike evans makes any play like mike can make a one yard screen pass and everyone would be like oh i can't wait to see that tomorrow because i didn't get the fan experience yeah today. the place was like shaking when he made that catch it was like yeah, was it was fun. just so sick. It's the that only way fun. to describe it. Pat Riley wants to know: Is it true, as reported, that Brady is running a four five forty now that his MCL has been repaired? 
it is about as true as you being the Pat Ryan. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> that's what we'll say about that. But it was a great practice today, man. Some practices I'm not the box practices, but some practices you go to and you cover, and they're a little bit dull. Like it mm-hmm. doesn't. It's the pace, but. It was fast. It was crisp. There were unbelievable highlight reel plays on both sides. Depth guys showed up. The energy was awesome. Um, you know, I wasn't sure what to expect. I knew Arians had been down on some of their practices. And before pads came on, it feels like all the padded practices have been great and gotten rave reviews. Maybe that's what they needed. I don't know. But I wasn't sure what to expect coming back and, and seeing it. But it feels like a team that's very focused right now. And has a lot to prove. And so it was great. And um, we'll see what tomorrow holds and what the coming days will hold. The next, the first preseason game is what, 12, 11 days away. Um, yeah. And I can't tough. freaking wait, dude, to cover this team. I can't wait. We're blessed. Uh, y'all are blessing to us to be in here. We appreciate you all the comments, the questions, the attendance today was great. All that we'd ask is ask yourself, like, if, if, is this the best, best Bucks coverage out there? Is this the best? Practice recaps, I've heard them. I get more information on the Peter Report podcast than anywhere else. And if the case, if the answer is yes, and that's been your experience, man, tell people tell people about the Peter Report podcast. You guys are our best form of advertising to grow what we do. Get us to 5K subscribers. Get us beyond 5K subscribers. We rely on you all for that. We love you all for that, for your ability to spread the news on this podcast. So tell people. Let them know where you can find all the best Bucks content. If you know Bucks, Bucks fans and they don't know about the Peter Report podcast or watch the Peter Report podcast, this is just the beginning. We've got stuff in store for you all this season on this platform, on YouTube, that is yep. going to change the game for Bucks fans. It's going to be special, fun stuff that I can't believe we're going to be able to offer this year, and we are really excited for it. So if you got the chance, subscribe yourself. If you're not yet, go over to Peter Report TV on YouTube, subscribe, but tell people about it because the podcast is just going to be the beginning. There's more fun stuff coming from Matt, from myself, from JC, from Scott, from Paul, from Jack, from who knows. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun on this show. So make sure you're tuned in to everything that we're doing. Until next time, which will be tomorrow at 4 p.m. Eastern, where we report on another Bucks practice. Thanks so much for listening to the Pewter Report podcast. Out. Check out our Instagram, too, at Pewter Report. <laughs>